our text, I wanted to give you a definition of biblical hope. So biblical hope is a hard-fought confidence in God's good provision while we actively wait for God to act in times, in difficult times. So biblical hope is a hard-fought confidence in God's good provision while we actively wait for God to act in difficult times. Biblical hope is not wishful thinking. Biblical hope is not the sense of, man, I really hope the coronavirus goes away. Um, That's not biblical hope. There's a hard-fought confidence that's part of our hope as we actively wait for God's good provision when we're going through difficult times. And that's the hope that Paul was praying for in the book of Romans that you heard Mike and Tracy um, uh, end with in the video. Um, And I love this, this prayer that Paul has for all the people in Rome. He says, may the God of hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Romans 15, 13, Paul prays this prayer. And I love this prayer because it seems to incorporate three of the four candles of Advent. The God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And we're going to light the candles next couple of weeks of peace and joy. And if Paul would have just thrown in love, we would have had all four. But he left it out. And actually, this is our desire for everyone who hears the message of Christmas is that you would be filled with God's hope. That in a year of uncertainty that you would experience God's joy and God's peace. And I'm super excited for the next couple of weeks as we explore what that means in our lives. But this is what I've learned over the past 30 years of ministry. There are times when we lose hope. There are times in our lives where we we don't have this confidence that we wonder where God is and what God is doing. And what I find interesting, it's often in those times where we lose hope, we're angry, we're afraid, we're frustrated, It's often at those times that we feel like we can't go to church because we feel like everyone in church is feeling pretty good, but we feel isolated and alone. It's like 27, 28 years ago, we had just finished a church service in Baltimore where I was ministering at a Methodist church at the time. And as I was kind of going, we used to wear robes. I was taking my robe off. Um, A mom of one of the women in the youth group walked up to me And she said, Tom, I need to talk to you. I know we're not supposed to talk about this stuff in church, but I need to talk to you. I don't think I can do this anymore. I don't think I can stay in my marriage. I am so done with this. She had this this huge sense of being overwhelmed and overdone with the kids, with her husband. And she even said this, I look at my other friends who have gotten a divorce and they seem to have their lives together. I don't think I can do this. And what struck me was actually her first comment. I know I'm not supposed to talk about this in church. Because she felt a sense of, you don't talk about hard things in church. Especially during a Christmas season. So I listened, and um, I mean, there's no quick answer. I prayed with her and, and just received what she had said. And I prayed her frustration with her and for her. Um, and then she left. The real good news in that story is 40 years later, still married and loving her family. But there was something about the need to bring that pain before God. I've learned over and over again that often what we need is someone who allows us to express our pain, our anger, our frustration, our depression, our sadness, allows us to express that in the context of knowing God. 
because it's in that context of knowing God that we will find help. It's not unusual for people to feel as Jeremiah felt as he wrote the book of Lamentations where he says this, This is why I weep and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me. No one to restore my spirit. Jeremiah was at a place of absolute loss and he felt as if no one would understand his loss. No one could restore his spirit. And when we're in that place, we feel alone, isolated, but even more than that, we feel like there's no hope because no one fully understands my pain. This morning, we have been given a gift And that's a gift that God has given his people for those who are going through extremely difficult times. It's a gift that leads to hope. So let me be extremely clear. This place, whether you worship at home or in this building, is a sanctuary. And a sanctuary is for all those who are feeling lost, broken, depressed, angry, sad, frustrated. In fact, God has created his people to be those who receive that. And then it's often, what often happens is people find hope. But they first need to express their pain. And the gift that we've been given this morning is lament. Lament is a form of prayer that the people of God have had literally for thousands of years. And lament is a form of prayer that we often don't talk about because we're uncomfortable with how difficult lament can bring, can, how, difficult, how difficult times lament leads us into as we fully express those deep feelings of loss, frustration, anger, sadness, depression. And yet, lament leads us to hope. Because you see, lament does a couple of things. One is, when we talk about lament, we're talking about how we go to God with brutal honesty about our situation. We're just brutally honest with whatever we're going through. We're going to see that in Lamentations, just brutal honesty about our situation. And then God is brutally honest with us about his love. Like that's the other part of lament. We're brutally honest about where we are. And then God comes and reminds us of who he is. And he's brutally honest. And and then what lament does, it brings us hope. Because now we live in a world in which the worst of our lives can be brought to the best of our lives. And we live in that, that beautiful crucible of hope and loss. And God's love frees us to have a hard-fought confidence in God's good provision while we wait for God to act in difficult times. It gives us hope. So what we're going to do today is we're going to jump into lament that leads to hope. So before we do, let me pray, and then we're going to jump into it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, God, that you have a plan and a purpose. Like, God, right now, there are those who are hurting, who are listening to this message. Right now, there are those who are feeling a sense of loss and frustration with life. And this is the time where you can bring life and hope in the midst of all the difficult things we face. And Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit will will move in a deep and powerful way that these words of lament, these words of brutal honesty about life and the brutal honesty about God will speak deeply. God, I pray that you would heal people this morning. God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would bring salvation to people this morning. God, I pray that now and in this time, that you would speak deeply and richly into our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I, in fact, we're going to speak out of the book of Lamentations. I've never taught out of the book of Lamentations before. Phyllis, thank you for your guidance of how to find the book of Lamentations because it's just five chapters, this really small book, surrounded by really big books of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, 
And it's just this powerful, this powerful text because Jeremiah, the one who wrote the book of Jeremiah, also wrote Lamentations. And he is writing to a people who have experienced the devastation of Jerusalem. Some of you remember your Hebrew history where the Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem. And when they destroyed Jerusalem, they took many of the Israelites to exile in Babylon, but they didn't take everybody. There was a group of people who stayed in Jerusalem and Jeremiah writes to these people. So he's writing to the people who see the devastated city every day. They were the marginalized. They were the victimized. They were the ones who weren't important because the Babylonians took all the important ones and left them to tend to the ruins. And Jeremiah writes this lament to those people. And what we'll see and what we'll learn is that lament is God's pathway for those who are hopeless to find hope. Lament is God's road to take those who are in despair to find peace. Lament is God's elevator to take those who are feeling absent from God or distant from God to feeling close to God. Lament is what Jesus did on the cross. So as, as we walk through these verses, I want you to remember our example of lament comes from Jesus on the cross. Do you remember when he was on the cross going through the brutal experience of crucifixion? He cries out at one point, my God, my God, why? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now this is a man who knew the end of the story. This is a man who knew God was doing a redeeming work for the world, and yet he cries out in his pain, both physical, emotional, and spiritual pain. And he asks that question that we are allowed to ask, why? For him, his pain was, why have you forsaken me? And it was a prayer of faith, my God, my God. God has given us this gift of lament so that we might discover hope in the most difficult of circumstances. It begins with brutal honesty. What we're going to do is we're going to look at three areas in which we can lament, or there's a lot of places in our lives. We're just going to look at three. How do we pray when we are the victims or we're experiencing pain because of what other people have done? How do we pray when we're just longing for the past because our present life is not as good as it was in the past? And how do we pray when we recognize our own actions, our sinfulness has caused us to be in a horrible place? How do we pray with brutal honesty which leads us to a whole new day? So in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 11, Jeremiah, again, is looking at the people who have been decimated. They're still in Jerusalem. They see the city that has been burned. They see the temple that has been destroyed. And they're experiencing that because of what the kings and the religious leaders have been doing for about 100 years. They're pure victims in this situation because it was the leadership in Jerusalem. It was the leadership in the religious community that had turned away from God and went after other political things or other gods. It was that leadership that had turned from God. And for a hundred years, the prophets had said, turn back to God. And for a hundred years, they kind of did, and then they didn't. And eventually, devastation happened. And who suffered? The people. So Jeremiah sees this, and this is what he writes. All the people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures for food to keep themselves alive. Look, O Lord, consider for I am despised. Jeremiah sees the pain of the people and he prays that pain to God. He's like, God, look at this, man. They're, they're bartering for food right now. They didn't even do anything. Like, man, the, the, the kings and the leaders have turned us away from God and now they're the ones who are living in the rubble trying to pick up the pieces and they're just trying to survive. See, Jeremiah does not hide his frustration or his pain or his sadness. 
for a people who have been literally led to a destructive pla a place that's destroyed because of others. There are times in our lives when we experience pain, frustration, we experience uh, the absolute negative, the evil of life because of other people, and we've done nothing to deserve it. And it's at those times that we've been given the gift of lament. Because lament is so much more than just complaint. Because remember, man, if you've been victimized, if, you are the, if you're experiencing suffering because of someone else, it's really easy to simply complain. It's easy to simply complain because you're justified because what's happened to you is not fair. And we all tell our kids, well, life isn't fair, but none of us like the reality when it hits us. And when it's not fair, we take those emotions, those feelings, and we present them to God in lament. And God has the way of freeing us from simply complaint. Because we take all of that which is in us and we put it before God. Some of you know the name Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a man who was imprisoned in concentration camps in Germany during World War II. And as he was in those concentration camps, he was a psychologist, he decided to study how do people survive when they are in horrible situations. He wrote a book, A Man's Search for Meaning. Most of you, some of you have read that book. In that book, he says this. Forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing. Your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. I'm going to read it one more time. Forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing. Your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. The lives of the Jews and others in Germany were shut down way beyond anything that we have experienced over the past 10 months. Everything was stripped away. Viktor Frankl saw that what gives life meaning, what makes it possible, is to realize that anything can be taken from us except our ability to choose how we shall respond. What lament does when we present that loss to God, it frees us to hear more, more clearly God's desire for our response than just our own complaint. I'm going to say that again. What lament does when we give God all of these feelings, these emotions, is it frees us to more clearly hear what the Holy Spirit has to us when we choose to respond by being brutally honest with God. Some of you know the name Michael Morissette. Michael Morissette and his wife lost their daughter, Christina, at Borderline Bar and Grill two years ago when she did nothing to deserve it. A man came in and killed, and she was one of those who were killed. Michael lost his daughter in a moment. A year after Borderline, we did, a, on the anniversary, we did a presentation at the Civics Art Theater in Thousand Oaks. It was a time of storytelling to let people tell their stories. Michael told his story. And as he talked about his grief, as he talked about his love for his daughter, he began to talk about how he was responding. I mean, you could feel his emotion. You could feel his grief. And over the last two years, he has chosen to love and to care for others in the loss of his daughter, Christina. In fact, this year, on Thanksgiving. I became a friend of Michael's. After that event, I just friended him on Facebook. And this year on Thanksgiving, he posted this that says this, because someone carries it well doesn't mean it isn't heavy. That was his way of simply saying, man, I'm, you see me, I'm doing pretty good, but that doesn't mean this pain is not still there. And it got me thinking, I wonder what he had posted on his first Thanksgiving without his daughter. 
And on his first Thanksgiving, he, he, he said, I was looking for some way to have hope because he was going through some difficulty. And you, I hope you can see that on your screen. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. At the first year after his daughter's death, on the, right around the anniversary, he was honest with God. He was brutally honest with what he was feeling. And he began to find God was with him in desert places. His lament freed him to experience what God had for him. One place we experience lament is when we experience pain because of other people in which we had no control over. Another place we experience lament or we have the opportunity to lament before God is when we realize that our lives today are not as good as they were in the past. We, we struggle with that. At the very beginning of Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1, he writes this. How deserted lies the city. He's talking about Jerusalem that's been devastated by the Babylonians. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow she is who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. His lament begins with remembering the past and that just causes pain. He remembers like how beautiful Jerusalem was, how beautiful the temple was and now it's destroyed. And what does he do? He takes those feelings of loss and he presents them to God. He simply presents, he goes, God, this is true. This used to be a beautiful spot, like a queen. And now it's like a widow. Have you ever had this feeling? That you wish life had a rewind button? You wished you could go back to when life used to be good? Many people have expressed to me over the last 10 months how we long for 2019. We long for 2018. We, we long for the Thanksgiving and holiday season we had in 2016. Or we look at our kids who are um, isolated at home and are experiencing this, and, and we long for our kids to have the experience that we had growing up. And we don't understand why it's happening now. And we can enter into a season of complaint or a season of lament where we give those real feelings, we just express all of that to God, we pray that into our prayers, and we just say, God, I remember when. I've worked with lots of people over the years who are grieving. I feel like God has given me that part of my life to be in ministry with others. There, there was a man I was working with, uh, caring for, loving, working with is the wrong verb. There was a man I was meeting with, and he had lost two wives, both to cancer. First wife he lost to cancer um, was hard, and he said for three or four or five years he was in this place of pain. And then he met this other woman, and they got married. He had another 20 years. He said he just felt like the luckiest man ever because he had two women for both over 20 years that cared for him, and he was able to love. And when his second wife died of cancer those memories simply brought pain because now he was alone. He and I met together for about a year talking. And I remember him sharing with me, he, uh, he said, Tom, this is going to sound really weird. He goes, at night, I reach over and kiss her pillow because we would always kiss goodnight. And he goes, I, would, I always bring into the room a glass of water because I always brought her water before we went to bed. He said, is that weird? Is that wrong? Should I not be doing that? And after close to 30 years of ministry, I simply said to him, man, you could just make that your prayer. Like, let it be a moment where you and you enjoy the experience of remembering her in bed next to you and kissing her goodnight. And let God know that you miss her. Let God know you're feeling the absence of the one you love lying next to you. Make it a prayer. And know it's not wrong. 
Because he wasn't going to be there forever. None of us stay in a place forever. Lament is not a destination. Lament is a, is a roadway. It's a pathway. It's like an elevator. Lament is a process to bring us to the destination. And ultimately, that destination is God. It's interesting, um, just even last week, I was meeting with a man who, whose wife also passed away. They had been married for 67 years. They had been dating since they were in middle school, so they knew each other in relationship for 73 years. And uh, uh, I know him just a little bit, and we sat together, and he just kept saying the same thing. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. I just, I just don't know what I'm going to do. He told me about the life that they had. He showed me pictures, and he goes, what am I going to do now? When someone's going through grief, there's no quick answer to that question. But what lament frees us to do is to present those feelings to God. So I simply prayed his words. Lord, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what he's going to do. God, you've given him a life that he's loved. And right now he doesn't know. So Lord, we come to you and we ask for your grace, God. Let your grace pour out. Because we don't know what to do right now. And right now this is hard hard lament is absolute brutal honesty with God and what happens is it frees us to move forward sometimes we lament because people have done things to us and we're the victims of those situations sometimes we lament because our present day isn't what our past was and sometimes we lament because of our own personal sin that has put us in places that we never wanted to be listen to what Jeremiah writes in Verse 14 of chapter 1. My sins have been bound into a yoke. By his hands they were woven together. They have come upon my neck and the Lord has sapped my strength. He has handed me over to those who cannot understand. Jeremiah feels the weight of his sin in the midst of this loss. And he's like, And it's like a yoke. It's like God puts something on his neck and it just saps his strength. Have you ever been in a situation where you know that what you've done in the past has hurt other people, has hurt yourself, and has separated you from God? Have you ever had that experience where you know what you've done in the past was absolutely wrong? We sometimes say, well, we were just doing our best at the time, the best we could. But we know for some things, for some things, not all things, but there are some things in which we didn't do the best we could. We actually turned and satisfied our own selfishness. We satisfied our own needs. And others were hurt because of it. And as life has moved on, you're feeling the consequences of those actions. It's at those times that the prayer of lament is a tremendous gift. Because we can just be totally honest with God, saying, God, I did this. My sins are sapping away my strength. God, this is what I've done. And then God frees us to experience his grace. But if we hide our sin as it slowly saps away our strength, we don't get to experience grace. Because that which is in us is holding us back. And we have to let that go. Better yet, we have to be honest with God and present it before him. I was talking with a college guy once. He was devastated because he felt like uh, his uh, interactions with pornography were going to ruin his life. He felt the pain of that. He had been very interactive with it, and he feels like he couldn't get rid of those images when he wanted to have a pure relationship with whoever would be his bride. It was interesting as he confessed that to me. I did not say, oh, it's okay, you'll be fine. I didn't say any of that. I just said, yeah, you need to go to God with that. You just got to go to God with that and tell him everything. Present it before him. Don't hide it. Because when we hide our sin, it has power over us. When we confess our sin, God frees us from it. That's a prayer of lament. 
There's a lot of places in our lives where we can be brutally honest and we can cry out to God, whether it's in loss, whether it's in grief, whether it's in betrayal, whether it's in sin, whatever it might be, we can be brutally honest with God. And then as we do that in prayer with God, God begins to bring light. Because lament is not a destination. We do not stay there. It's a roadway. It's a pathway. We're on a journey. And for some of us, that pathway moves quickly. For some of us, we ride that pathway for a while. But lament is a pathway that brings hope to the hopeless. Lament is a roadway that brings peace to those in despair. Lament is an elevator that brings us into the presence of God when God feels absent. God's light can break through because we've emptied ourselves to receive what God has for us. Listen to what Jeremiah says in verse 19, which Phyllis read to us. He said, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. So he's remembering all that which we've talked about. He's, and, his, and his soul is literally like on the floor. His soul is downcast. And then he says this in verse 21. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. He goes, I presented all of this to God. I know, brutally honest with God. And he goes, that's what I remember. And then he goes, and yet, I love those words in the faith of Christians. And yet, no matter how hard it gets, and yet, he goes, I want to remember something else. I want to remember that which brings hope. Listen to these next words. They are like, the sun breaking through the night. These next words demonstrate the powerful love and the promise of God. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Isn't that, isn't that just a powerful word right there? If you're still living, you're not done. Like, I think he might have said that to the people in Jerusalem. If you're still living, you're not done. God's been faithful. And he, we know this. If we're still alive, God still has a work for us. We are not consumed because of God's great love, his chesed, this, this powerful, I wish we could go for it for a while, but this word in Hebrew, which is God's loving kindness, God's powerful love that never stops. Because of his great love, you are not consumed. You're still here, baby. Make it happen. I mean, that, that, that's the, the joy of that. And this is how we do it. When we're feeling super down, when we present it before God, he says, because of God's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. Like they never fail. That, that word there, compassion, his mercies, they never fail. To the college student who's who's concerned and rightfully so about his use of porn, God's compassions never fail. For the man who lost two wives, God's compassions never fail. For the, for the one whose daughter was killed at borderline, God's compassions never fail. For those who lived through the Holocaust in a concentration camp, God's compassions never fail for you. For me, God's compassions never fail. In fact, he goes on to say, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I love that. I mean, like God's mercy, God's compassion is new every morning. Why is it new every morning? Because as broken, frail human beings, we need it every morning. I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you've experienced God's forgiveness one day and you're like, okay, I'm forgiven, I'm loved, I've been to whatever, and you're feeling good. And then the next day you're like, oh, I can't get rid of this feeling. That's okay. Guess what? God's mercies, new every morning. I don't know if you've ever had the experience where someone has done something to you and you are angry, you feel betrayed, and you finally get to the place of forgiveness. And you're like, okay, I forgive them. I, I'm moving on. I'm letting go and letting God 
well, doing all that stuff that we're, so, we're supposed to do, and you're, you're feeling, okay, I can let this one go. And then the next morning you wake up, you're like, oh, those people are still alive. God's mercies are new every morning because we need it every morning. And, and that's, that's the beauty of lament because when we lament, it frees us to receive his portion, his forgiveness. In fact, that's what he says next. He says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait or I will hope in him. We get to choose in Christ. We've been given the power to choose where we're going to take our portion from. We can let our portion, like, a, like say a meal, you've been given a portion, a part of a meal. You can let your portion be a place of complaint. And complaint, we can live there, and complaint often just brings us to more difficult places. You can let your portion be a place of lament. And lament is when you take those places that are deep and difficult, and when you present those to God. And as God ministers to you, you can choose your portion to be a place of God's mercy and love. And hold on to that. I've got a really good friend. Some of you know him. His name is Tim Smith. Um, Tim is the guy I surf with once a week. Usually we surf. We try to surf once a week. Sometimes we don't make it. Um, Tim is my donut buddy. We always get a donut or something after surf. And if there's no surf, don't worry. We still get our donut and coffee. For the last 10 months, Tim has been out of work. He's been out of work and everything changed. When you're in your early 60s and you lose your job, it's difficult to find a place. And uh, we would gather, we would go, we'd get in, the, get in my van and we'd be drive down to the surf and um, Tim was able just to express the real feelings of always applying for a job and not hearing back or getting the first interview and then not hearing back and all these things that happen when you apply for a job. That's what he was going through. And he would express himself and I would listen. I'd just, you know, basically just listen. And then inevitably, Tim would do this. Inevitably, Tim would go all of this. He would kind of get out his, his lament and then he would say, but you know, I was in scripture this morning. And then he would talk about what he is hearing from God in Scripture. And you, you could tell that he was living a difficult time, but he wasn't living it on his own. In fact, at one point we were surfing and we were talking about waiting for surf and the expectancy of that. And then we related that to our ability to wait on God because we know that there will be another wave and we also know that God will renew his mercies every morning. So we're going to end with this. Jeremiah writes as he continues on, just to verse 26. The Lord is good to those who hope, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of our Lord. When we poured out our pain, when we've poured out our grief, when we've given it all, no shame and tears, we've just presented it before God, we've been in the act of lament, we've poured out our confession. Jeremiah says that's a good time to sit and be still. Many of us love the phrase, be still and know that God is God. We need to pour it out and then there is a time where we sit quietly. Inevitably, your healing comes from the one who heals, and that's God. Inevitably, your peace comes from the God of peace. Your hope comes from the God of hope. Your joy comes from the God of joy. And sometimes, it's a hard fight. And the hard fight is simply to pour it out before God. Biblical hope is a hard-fought confidence in God's good provision while we actively wait for God to act in difficult times. Do you want to join the battle? God has given us 
a tremendous gift in the act of lament. In fact, check this out. You, you can be the one who helps others find healing. You can be the one who receives someone's pain, their grief, their loss. You don't have to fix it. You receive it. And as you receive it, you, you get to be God's vessel. Because you might be at the place where you know God's mercies are new every morning. And you can be the one that receives it and then simply walks with the person as they discover that same truth. Don't talk them out of their pain. Point them to a God who receives it. And then we find hope.